another uh, mutation. We've seen a lot of movement, a crowded space of drugs. Um, Ross, you've led a, a lot of the studies and led the way with this particular uh, genotype. You want to first talk about the prognosis of Valkyrie range lung cancer? There's been some nice work you've published recently. Well, well there, there, I mean, there's a, there's a few publications out there. Uh, there was a study looking in, in community sites, which only had about a two and a half year uh, prognosis. Uh, there was one from Zosha Center, I think, with about a four and a half year prognosis. And of course, I'm going to tell you about R1, which is something like a 6.8, <laughs> nearly seven year prognosis, which is hardly a randomized study. I just <laughs> like to point out. Uh, what, I think what all, the, all of them have in common is what determines your prognosis tends to be access to multiple lines of therapy. And I think um, there's a reflection of when these studies were done. And so obviously, as more and more drugs come out, I think the prognosis is going up. It goes back to some of the things we talked about. You have to think about these patients with uh, stage four disease who are going to live for years, yeah. possibly with very good quality of life. They may return to work. They may do all of the things they want to do in their life. We shouldn't be giving them whole brain radiotherapy. And even small toxicities are going to start to matter yeah. because they want normal quality of life. Yeah, incredible longevity for these patients, though, uh, due to the sequencing strategy. Speaking of sequencing strategy, so walk us through, Ross, uh, how you approach a newly diagnosed Alcrea range lung cancer patient. What's your drug of choice? How do you sequence? Are there factors that go into what you're using up front? So in terms of first-line drugs, we have uh, FDA approved. We have crizotinib, seritinib, and electinib. Of those three, it's a pretty easy choice because uh, electinib has beaten crizotinib and seritinib was only compared to chemotherapy and it's pretty toxic and they don't even have a sales force for seritinib anymore, Nevada's folk tell me. Listed in the NCCN guidelines is also brigadinib. Now, brigadinib data was only presented uh, in the fall of 2018, and the data is still immature. I think all we can say about brigadinib is it looks at least as good as electinib. But I think the key thing to take home is in the post crizotinib setting, brigadinib is clearly much better than electinib. Median PFS 16 months as opposed to sort of seven or eight months. We saw it this ASCO in the post-next generation inhibitors, now we're seeing response rates of brigadinib in the 40 to 50% range, essentially comparable to lorlatinib. So it looks like it's, it's a different, even though it's technically called a second generation drug, it's clearly in a different class. And I think when you look at ALTA1L, that first line study, we know that the hazard ratio matures over time. And it's got a hazard ratio that's the same as Alex, but with almost 10 months less follow-up. Yeah. So when we move forward, how much better is it going to be? And so I think it's the one to watch. So do you do you still consider electinib your standard of care for first line alcohol range lung cancer? If I'm restricted by the FDA approval, then yes. Okay. Um, if I can finagle it for NCCN, or if it was, you know, if if you asked me, said if you said they were all sitting on the table in front of me, which one would I put myself on? I would actually put myself on brigadinib. Can you tell us how you dose when you start brigatinib? I'm curious about how you manage the, the early pulmonary toxicities and how you kind of watch those patients. Well, so I think what we're starting to realize, first of all, it's relatively rare. So unless you're going to see 30 out positive patients, you're never going to see a case. So it's, it runs at about somewhere between 3 and 6%. It's, we think it's now a completely unique pathophysiology. It's not the pneumonitis that you see with other TKIs. It happens pretty much on the first or second day. And if you stay on the drug, the symptoms completely disappear by about day five. So completely unique pathophysiology, almost fits with a kind of vascular spasm. I think the way to think about it is probably this event is not a random event like Russian roulette and you don't know who it's gonna happen in. Imagine it's actually happening in every single one of your patients and they for about five days will drop their respiratory function by 10 or 20%. So the patient in front of you is, you know, like Josh, a fit, you know, young guy, you know, obviously very buff looking, then uh, he, would, uh, he would tolerate it very well, you know, but if it was a bit more like Ben, uh, you know, who well, barely well wear, make his way well up the stairs, then I would, I would actually proactively do a sh more shallow step up regime, 30 milligrams for three days, 60 milligrams, 90 milligrams, and Ben will be fine because we'd sneak up on that event. I'm glad Ben's going to be fine. Thank yeah. you. Uh, other people's choice of, of therapy for ALK positive disease, treatment naive, is everyone debating between brigadinib or electinib, more convinced with electinib? 
uh, medium PFS updated for the lectin. 34, close to 30, 34 months. Who would have thunk yeah. five years ago? Three years on that drug. I mean, we should, we should point out, because we actually have a letter in, in press from the Alex investigators, that the, the, the median looks great. It's easy to remember. Because it's actually a plateau in the curve, it's probably not the best thing. And the hazard ratio is actually much more important. The mature hazard ratio is 0.43. So that's what brigadinib's got to try and beat. Mm. Other people's thoughts on how to manage upfront uh, ALK positive patients? I mean, clearly, electinib and brigadinib are fantastic options with really outstanding CNS control. And so I think both are very reasonable options. Again, electinib is the current FDA approved choice. I'm keeping my eye on the brigadinib data, though. One more question. Does the fusion partner matter up front on what you select? Is there any data on that? So far, no. There was some interesting data on whether the variant within EML formatted, but at least when we looked in Alex in, in, in a larger data set, it didn't seem to be statistically significantly different. I mean, there was some provocative data from your own center, but that was just, was it single center? I can't remember. Maybe you combined with a couple of other centers. I believe it was single center, but okay. I don't, I, don't quote me on that. Yeah. yeah, it seems to generate different resistance mechanisms, but it's not clear yet whether that leads to PFS differences right. or not.